Greetings and welcome to this edition of Positronic Hypersonic. I'm Barry P. Cook, and I'm here to do a recap and review for you of Godzilla Minus One. So let's get right to it. As the film starts, it's 1945, which is the end of World War II. And a man named Shikishima, a Japanese kamikaze pilot, pretends to have technical issues with his plane and lands on Odo Island, where the Japanese military had stationed a bunch of mechanics to work on planes in the area that were out on fighting missions. As he's there, Godzilla appears during the night and attacks the island, killing everybody except Shikishima and the lead mechanic, whose name I'm totally going to butcher, but it's Sosaku Takibana, who blames Shikishima for the deaths of the others because when he told Shikishima to go and jump in his plane and use the 20 millimeter gun on the plane to shoot Godzilla, he froze. He couldn't do it. He was afraid that if he attacked Godzilla, Godzilla would in turn attack and kill him. It's also important to note that the reason he pretended that his plane was broken was he didn't want to complete his kamikaze mission, which of course would have meant his death. The movie picks up after that two years later in 1947, after the war, following Shikishima's return to Tokyo, where we find that he's plagued by survivor's guilt. He's started a relationship with Noriko Uishi, who I know I said her name wrong, and they've adopted a child, Akiko, whose parents were lost in the bombing of Tokyo, along with Shikishima's parents. Godzilla, meanwhile, has mutated and enlarged after the U.S. fought with him and did some nuclear tests during Operation Crossroads, which also led to the destruction of several U.S. warships by Godzilla before it headed to Japan. Citing tensions with the Soviet Union, the U.S. refuses to help Japan with its Godzilla problem. Shikishima gets a job aboard a minesweeper called the Shinsei Maru, and he meets scientist Kenji Noda as well as some other men, and they're all tasked with stopping Godzilla's approach to Japan by using mines. They release a mine into Godzilla's mouth, ultimately, during a confrontation with him and detonate it. And though it blows a giant hole in Godzilla's face, he regenerates his face and carries on with his attack and his approach to Japan. The Japanese heavy cruiser Takoa, which again, I probably mispronounced, arrived at this time and engaged Godzilla, but was subsequently destroyed when Godzilla unleashed his heat ray. Shikichima tells Noriko about Godzilla's attack and also expresses his survivor's guilt to her. Godzilla makes landfall in Japan, attacking Ginza in Tokyo, and Noriko, who works in that city, witnesses the attack while Shikishima attempts to rescue her as the Japanese military attempts to engage Godzilla, but fails to do anything about him when Godzilla fires its heat ray again, decimating Tokyo and seemingly killing Noriko, among thousands of others. While Godzilla returns to the ocean, Noda prepares a plan to kill Godzilla. However, the government refuses to help, leaving it up to the remaining civilians and naval veterans to enact his plan. Shikishima recruits a reluctant Takibana to repair a broken down fighter plane prototype, which Shikishima will arm with explosives and fly into Godzilla's mouth and destroy it from the inside, seemingly finally carrying out his kamikaze mission from which he doesn't expect to survive. Noda comes up with a plan to destroy Godzilla by surrounding him with Freon tanks and rupturing them, which would cause Godzilla to rapidly sink to a depth of 1,500 meters, hoping that the pressure that resulted from this would crush him. Thinking that that might not work, he also had a plan B, which was to inflate balloons under Godzilla once it's at the bottom to force it back to the surface rapidly, killing it through explosive decompression. Godzilla is taken down to 1,500 meters by this plan, but manages to survive. The balloons are activated, forcing Godzilla up to 800 meters, but it manages to break free from the balloons. Two ships try to haul Godzilla to the surface, but don't have enough power to do so. Thankfully, a fleet of tugboats arrive to lend their assistance, and Godzilla is brought to the surface, injuring him, but not killing him. In fact, it just made him really mad, and it just as he's preparing to destroy all the ships with his heat ray, Shikishima flies the plane into Godzilla's mouth, destroying his head with the bomb on board the plane and preventing its heat ray from going off, which itself destroys the rest of Godzilla's body. 
the crew of the boats assume that Shikishima sacrificed himself to stop Godzilla's heat ray, but they look above to find that he ejected from the plane. They cheer and salute him as he's floating down, and it's revealed that Takibana forgave Shikishima and told him about the ejector seat and telling him to live. Back at the port, Shikishima receives a telegram and heads to a hospital with Akiko, where he reunites with Noriko, who it turns out survived the destruction she was part of with some injuries. The film then ends as a chunk of Godzilla's remains sink to the bottom of the ocean and begin to regenerate. And that's a very basic breakdown of the plot. There's a lot of nuance in the plot of this film. There's a lot of heart in the different character moments. There are a lot of characters that are well-written and which round out the story in a way that I couldn't get into in that breakdown without telling you about every second of the film, which would have taken forever. But believe me when I tell you, surrounding this basic plot description, there's a lot going on in this movie. There's a lot of poignant stuff that happens in this film, and it's just a really good movie. It's somewhat light on the actual Godzilla moments, which, you know, actually works to the film's benefit because this is not a film about Godzilla. It's not a film about a Godzilla attack. It's a film about human beings, about the human condition, about, you know, Japanese culture in the 40s. It's about, you know, people who've come through a devastating war on the losing end and really PTSD. I mean, that plot description describes it as survivor's guilt, and it is partly that, but it's also PTSD that he's dealing with. And there are just some great relationships among the characters in this film. The characters are themselves very endearing. And it's a moving film. The soundtrack at times is very evocative of the original Godzilla movies of the 50s and 60s and so forth. They use some of the exact music and it's very much a Japanese film, and it's very much an old style Godzilla film in terms of the character parts, because, you know, modern monster movies are kind of light on the character stuff. They kind of pay lip service to it, but the old movies didn't, you know, the old Godzilla movies didn't anyway, and this movie doesn't. This is very much a character driven film. It's very much a human drama driven film and it's just really really good the story is really really good and the godzilla stuff is just like the icing on the cake you know it's this huge adverse condition that the characters are up against which puts them through their paces but it could have been anything it could just have been conventional war it could have been a natural disaster it could have been anything it doesn't really make a difference what the adverse condition was in this film because the character stuff would be the same. And I think that's what makes it such a great movie. It's it's just a very moving film, a very well shot film. I mean, it's gorgeous and it's just, it's really worth the price of admission. I've heard a couple of people say they think it's the best movie of 2023. When I was watching it, I thought it could get you know, nominated for Best Picture, certainly Best Foreign Film at the Oscars. And I expect it to win a bunch of awards, actually, from the various organizations that, you know, give out awards for excellence in filmmaking. One thing that I didn't think was so great about the movie is the fact that you never get any sort of idea what Godzilla's motivation is for anything that he's doing. In the old Japanese movies, about Godzilla and even in you know modern non-Japanese Godzilla films there's always some sort of reason that Godzilla goes on the attack it's either that he's attracted to a radiation source and he wants to go and eat it or he is drawn to the sort of scent or smell or vibes in the air being given off by another gigantic creature that's on the other side of Japan and he has crosses through Japan to get to it. There's always some reason why Godzilla is walking through Japan 
or menacing, you know, the naval ships or whatever in these old movies, at least the good ones. Because, you know, towards the 70s and whatnot, it got kind of hokey. But in this film, there's no, they never explain to you why Godzilla is doing what he's doing. They never say, oh, he's drawn to the nuclear power plant or the uh, electricity factory, you know, or the other giant animal that we've captured in the past and have contained in this government facility. They never, there's no motivation for Godzilla to do any of the stuff that he's doing. Like, he's not provoked when he does the attack on Odo. He just attacks. And so it's just never really explained, and I thought that was odd. But moving along. That's really it. You've got to see this movie. It's it's really, really good. This is one, you know, that you should really go and see. I don't say that a lot. I say, you know, wait till it comes on streaming. Don't run out and see it. It's okay. That's not the case here. This is a really good movie. It's worth the price of admission. Go see this movie. That's what I'm going to say. All right, but that's really it. So I'm going to get out of here. I'll be back with another video soon. Until I return, I wish you peace and long life. Thank <laughs> you.